that we receive his message with open ears and receptive hearts. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Mike, for prayer and worship leading and, and for others contributing to the service this morning. Uh, I just want to say I'm looking forward to, to diving back into James because James continues to be deep and speaks, I think, to our lives. And, and I love when Scripture does that. Um, I want to acknowledge singing, Jesus be the center. May that be our prayer. May that be a way that we combat temptation. Singing. We got some good teaching on temptation from Jen and the, the children's story. Thank you for that. And I would add, singing is something that can help us fight temptations and certainly scripture songs. Jesus be the center. May Jesus be our center today, this week, and beyond. So I wanted to know, I read Psalm 105 verse 4 this week, and it reads, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek God's presence continually. And that made me think of Luke eleven nine. 9. Jesus is talking, and he's telling the believers, the followers, he says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. And in Matthew six thirty three, Jesus says, seek first, seek Initially, God's kingdom, God's ways, and these things will be added unto you. So I'm struck by the importance of seeking God and God's ways, of being intentional about that. And I believe seeking God involves action. Hmm. And I think some of those actions include intentional prayer, I think intentionally gathering with other believers, say in church, a Sunday school small group, I think that's another way we seek God's will and God's way. I think being open to being out in nature and looking and noticing what's God up to. I think study is also a significant part of seeking God. So if you remember from last week's message in Acts 16, Paul's ministry group had to keep seeking God. They had to keep searching for God's direction. It wasn't a one and done. If you think it's a one and done, wake up, church. It is a process. It was a process for Paul's ministry group. It is also a process for us. And I think that's relevant and important for us. The act of seeking God's will, God's way, God's wisdom is a regular thing that we need to pay attention to. So let's seek, keep seeking, keep searching, and may our unpacking of James 1, 12 through 18 May it give us some guidance, some perspective with our lives with regards to temptation and other things. So what can we notice in this text? So the first thing I want to bring out is this next slide. We are blessed when we endure or persevere through a temptation and or a trial. When you've worked through that, and you're like, yeah, I did it. I followed through on it. You are blessed. You are strengthened. You will grow. So you'll see the picture of the race here on a lighter note. So I remember being challenged to participate in a 15K run in Tulsa years ago. Well, I'm a sprinter. You know, I like to do things fast. Um, I sprinted in track in high school. I, you know, speed was my game playing softball and basketball, believe it or not. That was my game. And, you know, be aggressive, 
with that. So this idea of running a long distance race, that was pretty daunting for me. But at that time in my life, I decided, you know, I'm going to take that challenge. So I trained some. I did this 15K. I persevered with it. I didn't stop and walk, though that was indefinitely a temptation. So let me throw that out for, for some of us who are amateur runners. One of the hard parts is that little voice saying, eh, just stop. You hurt. You hurt a lot. Doesn't it hurt? You should stop training. And am I the only one that's ever heard that little voice in training? Just checking, okay? But church, that's also an example of how other temptations work. There's these little voice, yes, no, no, yes. And to fight through that and to, to overcome those, you are built up. You are blessed. And as we grow with that, I think that strengthens us. And I think that's some of what James is talking about here. Now, on a more serious note, through the years, I've had a variety of temptations in a variety of ways, just like you all. And I have these temptations, like Jen said, not because I'm bad or evil, but because I'm human. And you have temptations, not because you are bad or evil, but because you are human. I've had temptations in areas of substances, of food, of power struggles, of know-it-allness, of lust, of unhealthy relationships, of money, how to use it. The list could go on and on in the areas that humanity is tempted on. Amen? And there are many stories I could share about following through, fighting through those temptations and being stronger because of it. And that is this idea of being blessed when we persevere, when we work through a temptation or a struggle. Church, I read this quote recently in a devotion. It reads, You and I will never grow spiritually or relationally or in any area without discipline. Church, you and I won't grow in any area without discipline. Now, I also want to say that I believe it's huge and important not to dwell or focus too long on our failures with regards to temptation. Just like we have the ability to fight through and be strengthened from overcoming temptations, the reality is we will also fail and have failed. I won't look and ask for a show of hands. But this is a real thing, failing with regards to temptation. And I believe we need to give ourselves grace and forgiveness. I love 1 John 1, 9. John writes, if we confess our sins, if we are honest about our struggles, and temptations. God is faithful and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us. I love that. Church, that's in the Bible for a reason. You know why it's in the Bible? Because we need it. That's not just in there for me. That's in there for you. Because we are tempted and we fail in lots of ways. And to be honest about it before God can cleanse us and help us be better people and be blessed, as James is talking about. In church, we do better to be like Peter when he failed 
when he denied Christ and repented, moved forward and allowed God to use him. We do better to be more like Peter than like Judas who gave up. So let's keep moving on in James. In verses 13 through 16, I think there's another important thing to notice that can help us with our lives. That's the next slide. Church, don't blame God for the temptation. Do you see that in the text? And then note this cycle of temptation that James writes about in verses 13 through 15, or 13 through 16. So James says, no one when tempted should say, I'm being tempted by God. I'm blaming this on God. So James is saying, don't do that. That's not going to help you. And then he says, and this is the cycle, but when one, that's us, When we are tempted, it's from our own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Then when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and that sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. Notice the cycle of temptation and sin or bad behavior. And isn't that how it often works? We're tempted with the small thing. And that small thing comes a little bit bigger. And then a little bit bigger. And before we know it, that's all we can think about. Pay attention to that cycle. Know yourself. Allow God to speak to you when it's this size instead of when it's this size. Or when you fail. Why shouldn't we blame God for temptation? So Jen referred to the 1 Corinthians 10 text. Verse 13 in 1 Corinthians 10. And and Paul's writing. He knew a thing or two about temptation. Temptation and about forgiveness. So he wrote, no testing, no temptation that you has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. You're not the only one struggling with whatever you're struggling with, whether that's in areas of money, power, whether it's areas of know-it-allness, power struggles, or whatever it is. Different people have these, you know. And then Paul writes, God is faithful, and God will not let you be tested beyond your strength, but with the testing will also provide a way out. God helps us. That's the point I take away from this scripture. God will give you opportunities for help, but you got to look for them. You got to want it. And sometimes in our cycle of temptation and sin, we kind of ignore it, right? We want to go our way. God wants to help us. I love Psalm 121. Verses 1 and 2, the psalmist writes, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Don't blame God because God helps us. The creator who created you and me, who knows our strengths but also our weaknesses, wants to help you. Don't blame God. Here's another reason not to blame God. God loves us. Have you heard that a time or two in church? God is like the the heavenly parent who wants what's best for you and is rooting for you. But God, like a heavenly parent, also knows that we will fail. 
And God wants us to be able to rebound from that. Hence, teaching of confess your sins, name them, be honest with God and, and in some cases with other people so that you can have victory over those struggles. But are you open to asking for and receiving help and wisdom and love? Are you open to receiving wisdom, to, to paying attention to patterns of, of why you're tempted by such and such? Are you open to have wisdom, self-awareness? Are you open to that? So I look at the next section in James, verse 16. James writes, don't be deceived. Don't be fooled, my beloved. He's saying, don't be fooled by that voice that says, you got you to blame God for that. Don't be fooled and deceived, my loved ones. And then he goes on in verse 17, he says, every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above. James is saying, God is good. God loves you. God wants to help you. I think that's also why Jesus says, ask, seek, knock. Because in the Matthew 7 text, Jesus goes on and says, if if." If your child is asking for bread, what parent is going to give a snake instead? He's saying the heavenly Father gives good, generous gifts. God loves you. God loves me. And God wants to help us with our struggles, with our temptations. Now, before I end, I want to go back to James 1. 19, excuse me, 9 through 11. So I don't want you to think I missed this text. Because I think James is talking about a very real temptation. And that's the next slide, Sue. In James 1, 9 through 11, a very real temptation is named. Trusting our riches and our wealth above the Lord. I believe there's a real temptation for many of us to trust our riches, our wealth, our things above God. I believe it's one thing to have wealth. It's another thing to be humble and generous and helpful with your wealth. Amen? God needs people with means who are generous. But there's a temptation to hoard and to keep it to ourselves. So I like how Peterson uh, writes in this text, James 1, 9 through 11. When down and outers get a break, cheer. But when the arrogant rich are brought down to size, cheer. Well, that's a little uh, schadenfreude there, I think, from James that I don't think is particularly healthy, but it's there. He writes, prosperity is short-lived as a wildflower, so don't ever count on it. I think he's saying, be careful, be cautious. You know that as soon as the sun rises, pouring down its scorching heat, the flower withers, its petals wilt, and before you know it, that beautiful face is a barren stem. And he says, well, that's a picture of the, quote, prosperous life. At the moment everyone is looking on in admiration, it fades away to nothing. So James is using some harsh language to talk about this very real temptation to trust our riches and our wealth. 
Barclay also writes a little bit. And in my study, I found it worth sharing with you. He writes, A person who puts their trust in riches is trusting in things which the chances and changes of life can take back from them at any moment. Life itself is uncertain. James's point is this. If life is uncertain and humanity is so vulnerable, calamity and disaster may come at any moment. Since that is so, a person is a fool to put all their trust in things like wealth, which we may lose at any moment. A person is only wise if they put their trust in things which they cannot lose. Hmm. James is poking at us. I Man, I don't know about you, but I like having more. Let's be honest, church, right? Who doesn't like having a little extra at the end of the month, right? And I'll tell you, I love my financial situation now better than when I was in my 20s living paycheck to paycheck. But, but James and, and God through James is saying to me and to you, don't put your trust totally in that. Don't put your heart totally in that because it can be gone. And there will come a time when it doesn't matter. James urges the rich, and I'm going to put myself there to help others of us put ourselves there because in, in view of the world, we are rich, okay? James urges us rich to cease to put their trust in that which their own power can amass. James urges us to admit our essential human helplessness and humbly put our trust in God who alone can give the things which abide forever. That's a hard word. But may the Spirit stir in us helping us be aware of who we are and where we stand with our things and our wealth but then also be persons of generosity because God needs generous people. God needs people who are open and caring. But God wants to guide and help us. Church, it's a real temptation to trust ourselves and our stuff above God. So I want to close with Romans 12, 2. And I encourage you to turn there. Romans 12, 2. Remember Jen said in the children's story, she said, our minds are powerful. Romans 12, 2 reads... Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind. Hmm. How can we face any temptation? The mind is powerful. Hence, I believe, Paul's use of the phrase renewing your mind. And I think there are many ways to re renew your mind. Some of that can involve scripture. Some of it can involve prayer. Some of it can, can involve accountability with other brothers and sisters. Some of it can, can involve the discipline of worshiping together that can help us renew our mind and, and not just be distracted by everything that's going on around us. 
Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So you can discern what is the will of God. So you can be self-aware. So you can, oh man, maybe I am relying on my own strength here. Maybe I am giving too much credence to this voice in my life and it's not a healthy voice for me. Or maybe as we renew our mind, the Spirit of God says, you're doing great. Thank you. Thank you for how you are participating in my kingdom. Because the Spirit does that too. The Spirit of God is not always saying, change, 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 more, more, more. You're bad, you're bad, you're bad. Uh Uh-uh. The Spirit of God more often says, I love you. You are awesome. We're lifted up. And then in due time, the Spirit says, hey, um, I might want to pay attention to this. Oh, okay. But when it comes from a place of love, it's a whole different ballgame. Church, let us not be just conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, by being open to Scripture, to prayer, to time together as God's believing community. So then, we may discern what God's will is, what is good, what is acceptable, and what's perfect. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we need help for our minds to be transformed. And we recognize that this is a long process, but it starts at some point. And I would pray more brothers and sisters in the hearing of this message today would make the commitment with, to you to say, I want to renew my mind. I want to start again. I need some help facing this temptation or this temptation. Thank you, God, that you love us. That you enlighten us with that love. And like a loving, heavenly parent, you love us enough to help us be cleansed, and get new starts. I pray your blessing for each in this space, in the hearing of this message. In Jesus' name, amen.